Hi there, friends. I'll come in here with a quick note to let you know that the first global product owner summit organized by the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast is coming soon. To know more, check out the uh, bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's all one word, all lowercase. And uh, stick around to the end of the episode to know more. But for now, on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to a very special bonus episode uh, with friend and fellow organizer of the Agile Online Summit 2022, Dustin Thostenson. Hey, Dustin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Vasco. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you here. Dustin is going to share with us a very important topic, I feel, for all of us that work with with teams and try to help them. Uh, And uh, uh, I think the emphasis should be on trying to help them (laughs) rather than getting them to change. But we will talk a lot more about that with Dustin in a second. So we're going to explore the role of the Scrum Master, the Agile coach, or the consultant that starts working with the team and kind of starts getting that resistance that we are all so familiar with and and sometimes might even be fired for trying to change the team. So uh, Dustin, introduce the topic for us. Why is this topic what it is and why is it so important for you? Hey, thank you, Vasco. So this topic is really important to me because I've gone through a a change in my own my own career where you learn things, you find things that work really well, and then when it works well, you want to share it with others. You want to tell the world, "Wow, this is some amazing stuff. People can be happy, they can enjoy their jobs, they can have a great environment, and they can deliver amazing things to their customers." So you go out and you try to help other people. And sometimes what happens is it doesn't work so great. You might try to inflict that on other people. And sometimes if it goes wrong, people get fired. So this is really a culmination of uh, the time I've spent working with other companies, with other teams, seeing other people coming in and trying to help and failing. And in some cases, losing their jobs. And I, I've been thinking about that and I go, there's got to be a better way. People shouldn't have to lose their jobs when they're trying to help other people. Be- before we go there, uh, can you give us a, an example of what that would look like to lose one's job for trying to help a team do something you already know works in another team? Can you give us an example of what that is? Some of the examples that I've seen are when and you see what the team is doing and, and it triggers you where you're like, oh my Lord, this is not right. They're not writing unit tests. That's not how you scrum. That's not how you retro. And, and they act, um, they, they have a negative reaction, very energetic reaction to say, no, 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 you're doing it wrong. And then when the team would push back, they would push harder because you are confident and committed that the way that you know how to do things is correct and you forget about the act of change and you try to just force the change. And when that happens, uh, people will respond negatively as well. I saw one person um, want to get introduced to the team from the CIO and he asked the CIO, I need you to introduce me to your team. I need to have that authority from you. And the CIO responded, you're fine. You can do it yourself. And as the CIO walked in his office and shut the door, he followed him. And he opened the door and said, no, you don't understand. You need to introduce me to your team. They need to know that I have your authority. And as you can imagine, the CIO responded, no, you don't understand. And you're fired. Ouch. That can yeah. be a painful experience. Um <laughs> And uh, of course, that's one example, a real life example of of how sometimes we might be pushing things uh, too much beyond what the team or the organization is uh, willing or ready to accept at that moment. Um, and and of course, that that is it, the example you just shared is is a uh, a drastic, a a a very uh, I think visceral example. But there are many other forms of pushing back, right? There's many other forms of the team or the organization not really taking 
in what we are trying to give them, right? So what are, in your experience, some of those signs that, that you think highlight early enough, and I think that's important, that we as consultants, change agents, scrum masters, might be trying too much too early? I think that there are a lot of reads that you can have on the team to figure out if you're pushing too early. Um, but before we start leaning on the team and thinking outside of ourselves and looking at um, how we can blame others for what they're not doing to improve, uh, you, have to, you have to start with yourself. And in my experience, I think that there is an exchange between yourself as that consultant and when I say consultant, I'm using Jerry Weinberg's definition of consultant. He says, consulting may be defined as the art of influencing people at their request. So I'm not talking about a consultant on your business cards, right? It's, it's just that, that person in maybe a full-time employee along with your peers, maybe a formal consultant from outside of the company, but that person who is trying to influence people at their request. And to me, it begins with yourself, where if you're in an exchange with somebody else, you have to look at yourself first and say, what is it that I want out of this relationship? What do I want to get? And what do I have to give? And sometimes that comes across, um, it, it, might just feel like it's automatic and that we already know. But if you don't really know what you're expecting to get, and it, we can go against Maslow's hierarchy, you know, it could be money or security, belonging, esteem, uh, self-actualization. You have to be aware of what you're trying to get from the team, because if you're not getting the thing that you want, you're probably going to become frustrated and you might not understand why. So if you're not getting the thing, it's going to come back and the, the reactions that you give to them. So that's, that's what you get, right? That's the selfish side for yourself. What you have to give has to be something that they want. Are you, yeah. And, 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 that and let's define that a little bit further. You said what you have to give has to be something that they want. And uh, I'll pick just one example that you used previously, which is, oh my God, this team doesn't even have unit tests. They know they want unit, or sorry, they want unit tests. They just don't know it yet, right? So that what they want is is a, a very important realization, perhaps a threshold that we need to get to before we can start influencing. But uh, I, I think it's important for us to also realize how do we know if they want it, right? What's your own experience on that? Yeah. You're right. You're right. They might not know that they want it, right? So if you have a good idea of what it is that you're trying to give them, right? If if it's the, if you want to fix things, if you want to improve the process or create ideas, ask questions, inspire, whatever you decide there, um, if they don't want it, you're going to have to figure out why. And And you need to spend the time with them to listen to them and figure out what they do want, what their motivations are, and what their environment is influencing them or how their environment is influencing them. Uh, they, to use your example of unit test, um, you may see the problems that they're running into and it might be completely obvious to you that they're spending all this time dealing with quality issues. And if they just had some unit tests, they could invest a little bit of time and save a ton of time. So you need to plant those seeds and then emerge the needs. It, you might not be able to just start with writing the unit test. So what I'm thinking here, and I've done this, so uh, mea culpa here. Uh, what I'm thinking here is that our traditional or, or maybe even native approach for many of us is to say, hey, I see there's this tool that works. You're not using this tool. Start using this tool. And, uh, um, you know, we could even say th this tool is good for you because, and, and it has all of this benefit. But what I'm thinking is uh, that until there is a crystallized need, 
in yes. the team's mind, it's very hard for us to assign the tool to something they care about. Like we can tell them all the, let's call them statistical benefits of implementing DevOps. And there's even a book for that, Accelerate by Nicole mm -hmm. Forsgren, right? And we can mm -hmm. say all of that, but if they don't understand what problem they want solved, we can't link it. It's, it's almost like a, a, a piece of the puzzle that doesn't actually fit the puzzle yet, right? Yeah, yeah. What's in it for me? Why am I doing this? You're absolutely right. It's not good enough to just have the answers, is it? So that's, that's where that art comes in. How, how have you, have how have you solved it for yourself? Because obviously you're doing this as a day job. So you're constantly yeah. being faced with this type of situations. So how do you, how do you solve this, this uh, um, kind of potential conflict of having one puzzle piece that you know fits, but they don't have yet the opposite part of that puzzle piece? I might not always have the, the, the right answer. But usually I try to make sure that I can clarify what the problem is. A problem well-defined is a problem half solved. Um, and with the example that you were bringing up, the first thing that came into my head was name the problem. Can you name the problem that they're facing? And can they recognize that as a problem as well, where they can name it and they could go, wait a second, this is a problem because sometimes they just accept it. This is just the way things are. Somebody else designed the system. Somebody else is the manager. They're, they're taking care of all this. I'm just doing my job. Oh, you, you're facing a problem and you have the ability to change that. And probably to your example, if you use the tool, it could change that problem. Or if you change the process, it could change the problem. But if they can't name the problem and if they can't recognize it the same way that you do, that's the first step. Can they see it the way that you do? Because you probably have seen this a little bit more than you recognize it, the patterns. Have you used some facilitation or conversation techniques that help you to get there so that they have named the problem? Talking out loud is a big thing. You know, show them your problem solving technique. Uh, when I pull down code, first thing I ask, all right, can I compile the code? Do the test run. Are they, are they running, uh, you know, in a stable manner uh, for the problem that we're facing? Do we have test coverage on that problem? Can I run or create a new test to reflect the problem that we're currently seeing and be able to reduce the scope of the problem? We just keep asking these questions over and over and over to the point where when they see a new problem, the first thing I do is, does the code compile? Are all the tests running? Do we have test coverage on the problem that we're facing? Can we write a test to highlight the problem that we're facing? If you can show them those types of things, and then all of a sudden they start following those same simple habits, that, that can be a very helpful approach. And, and now by those habits, you think the ability to think through a problem in, in, you know, in a stepwise manner that tries to first name, then crystallize, reduce the scope of the problem, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you gave a technical example. Uh, but what if the example is a process example? I so wh why I'm asking is that yeah, what do you do? Doesn't... Yeah. So what wh what would you do? Well, no. I mean, like let, let's take a, a different example. Like you you will approach the same problem in a systematic way, right? So um, I don't know what's a good example. Maybe a retro. Are there are there things that you bring into a problem set where you find yourself asking the same questions repeatedly? And then arriving at a, a common answer, maybe a new answer every time. Are there things that you've experienced like that? So I, I was just thinking, for example, there are, uh, I, I can think of extreme situations like conflict resolution where thinking out loud might actually be worse, right? Because it might extrapolate and, or sorry, not extrapolate, but exaggerate reactions that are already in built in the team. But let's take a simpler example, which is, that the team feels frustrated because they depend on another team, which is not there uh, in the retrospective. Issue. Yeah. Uh, so how, how would you do this thinking out loud uh, process that you just described together with the team? So one of the things, yeah, dependencies is a great example. Asking yourself out loud, you know, what if? What if they were here? What if that person or that team was actually embedded in our team? 
what could we do? How could we have found out about this earlier? How could we work with this? Instead of accepting the way things are, ask about questions saying, what would better look like? If that team for the API, which is crashing on us right now, if they were on our team, what would that look like? Uh, if they had some tooling, what would that look like to make sure that they could have caught this problem earlier? If we could contribute something to them, what would that look like to make sure that they could have caught the problem before it became an issue for us? And when this you start thinking of that, that leads this, you to the answers. Yeah. These what if questions are actually very powerful uh, because they are a very simple way that is not pushy of planting that seed you were talking about earlier, but then letting the team take it, right? You're, you're not telling them, here's the solution, but you're telling them, uh, what if the world could be different, right? L what if we change this parameter here in, in our reality right now? Like, you know, the example you gave, what if the, somebody from that team would be working with us daily? What could that look like? And you don't need to tell them anything else, but they, they will immediately, the teams we're working with will immediately, because it's a what if question, right? They will immediately start imagining a different world and grab from it, and, and this is, I think, the powerful aspect for me, grab from that imaginary world what they think can be translated to their current reality. And, and what that does is that it now also puts the responsibility for change on the team, right? It's not us pushing, it's us creating the ability to imagine a different outcome and a different reality and the team actually working through what that would look like for them in practice. Absolutely, absolutely, Vasco. And, and you mentioned responsibility. Um, I know that this is a podcast, so we can't see my screen, but over my shoulder is the, uh, the responsibility process by Dr. Christopher Avery. And that is so important to me because there are these psychological stages that our brains are in. And we're using our brain to tell ourselves stories. So if we are in a state of blame, we will use our brain to tell ourselves stories about why we can blame somebody else. Why are they at fault? Why, are, why is that person at fault? And, you know, or justify, we'll, we'll use all of our brain to tell us reasons why we can justify the way things are. And that's how it is here. And what we're not doing, as you mentioned, is taking responsibility. We're not looking at what if, what could be, how do we want to see the world? How would it be better for us? What are the things that we could do? What do we wish that somebody else would do? And if you're not thinking about that, you're not searching for the solutions. And I think that's a major part with teams. If they're not even looking for the solution, if they're mm -hmm. accepting the way and, things are. And sometimes uh, it's perfectly natural for them not to be looking for the solution, right? If, if they are in a situation of this is just the way things are. Yeah. Uh, then they, they don't give themselves permission to even think of different possibilities. How do you help them get out of that? This is the way things are anti-pattern. Well, and, and to sit on that for a second, if this is the way things are, does it matter if you have the right answer? Does it matter if you have built the perfect tool for the team? If you if you made a bespoke tool just for this team, but they believe that this is just the way things are and they're not going to do anything about it, you're going to become very frustrated as that agent of change, aren't you? Because you know what the answer is. If you just did this one thing, it could be if better. You just listen to me. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, just do the thing I tell you to do and it'll be fine. And that's where that frustration comes from. So, so to go back to your question though, um, so what can you do for that? Um, I think it really depends on the relationship that you have with the people. Um, you have to understand what their needs are and what their wants are. And the truth is, if they don't want it, they're not going to take it. And if you continue to try to inflict change upon people, if you try to force help on somebody that doesn't want it, it's not going to work. 
And it's not your job to fix everything, to fix everyone. You and can't. especially not to fix others. Yeah. So well, one of the things that I experience as a change agent myself when I work with teams, um, and even taking all of this that you are talking about into account, which I, I hope I'm doing most of the time, uh, I, I still suffer from this incredible lack of patience. Uh, I don't necessarily start shouting at people. I mean, I might have done that as a younger me, but not anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I still feel this incredible urge to, you know, shake things up, right? Like, like find an extreme po potential consequence of something wrong the team is doing. How do you keep yourself in check? Uh, how do you keep yourself patient in the situation where you might see, like, this is so simple. Why can't they see the solution, right? How can how, how do you keep yourself patient in those situations? <laughs> I'm going to laugh about this a little bit, Vasco, because since you and I have worked together, you've seen me when I have become impatient. So I'm not the best person to answer that because I'm not perfect. Uh, <laughs> but that that's part of it, right? Like we we know that we're human, and I think that's part of it. Where it comes down to reminding yourself. What is it that I want out of this? What what do I have to give? And what do they want? And it does take time to reflect and to to think about it and to recognize what your triggers are uh, when when you start to kind of deviate from that path that you want to go down. Um, I love I love pairing. I love paired programming. I love paired coaching. I love when we would, uh, I used to travel for coaching and we would hang out at the hotel and the coaches would talk to each other and they would complain. They would let their frustrations go. Oh my goodness. If, if they would just do this thing, it could make their lives so much better. These people, oh, they're so close. And what we would often do is we would complain a little bit, you know, do some blaming and justifications. And, and then we would recognize, well, they, they do need help. Um, they want help because they hired us. So what can we do? And going back to your question, I think that the answer is to continue to look at what can we do? What approach do we want to take? And, and how calm can we remain as we try to take them down that path and to try to help them? Um, if you don't know where you're going, it becomes even more frustrating and even when you do know where you're going, it still takes a lot of patience. There is uh, one Yogi Berryism, right? If you don't know where you're going, no way we'll take you there. That's my adaptation. <laughs> you say any way we'll take you there. My, in, in our case, I think no way we'll take you there. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So, um, Dustin, obviously you, you have been a consultant for, for many years and, and you are a technical coach to many teams and, and have done that work for a while. So you've been exposed to these situations. And uh, I know that you've developed your own personal toolbox or framework to mm -hmm. handle this type of situations. Can you describe that for us? How, how do you approach a situation even before you know what the team needs or wants, right? Like how do you get yourself prepared and then how do you interact with them? What are the steps that you typically follow when you start this engagement with the new team? Uh, the first step is um, focusing on yourself. And, and it really is uh, taking inventory of what it is that you want to get out of this relationship and, uh, and what is it that you have to give them. Um, and part of that too can also be that inventory of what are the things that you think they need, but you don't have yet, right? Which is why you and I do so much research. We listen to podcasts and, and uh, go to conferences and read books, right? We continue to try to build up that tool set of our own, but that, that inventory is the first step. Um, the second step is to take inventory of the client, whether it is the client as a whole, you know, multi-billion dollar corporation, uh, a department, a team, an individual, and to understand what is their state, how are things working for them, and what are the things that they're trying to accomplish? What do they need? What do they want? And, and ultimately, what are they willing to do to get to that? 
And a lot of that comes just, um, I think most people, well, oftentimes, that those steps are skipped. We just kind of assume it. We go straight into doing stuff. Yeah. Just do it. Just do it. And, and, and then we find that it might not match up that well. So taking a little bit of time to just kind of read yourself and read the room can be helpful. And then, you know, holding up that mirror and being able to, again, name the problem, talk to the people to say, um, here is a painting I made with the shapes and the colors that you gave me. Does this reflect your reality? Show them that you are listening, you know, acknowledge that you're hearing them. Yeah. And if, if you can prove that you understand really what they're facing, that this isn't like every other problem, right? That you're not just coming in with a blanket solution, but you understand their specific solution or their specific problem. If they know they're being heard, then, then they might be able to start listening to you. But if people don't feel acknowledged, they won't. So you got to go kind of go through that, that groundwork of making sure that the connection is there. I see you, I hear you, I understand you. I can articulate it back to you so you know that I in fact do, or you can correct me if I'm wrong. And then we have that, that foundation built and we can move forward. Maybe then so they this, might be willing to hear and listen to you. Mm -hmm. So, so this step, if I understand you correctly, just name the problem, understand them and, and prove that you understand them in their own terms. It, it also sounds a little bit like what uh, I would call like build a relationship of trust, right? Like, uh, yeah. in, in other words, you need to get credit to spend credit. Yeah. Right? Is that how you look at it? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great way to put it. I like that. So what, what is the next step? So we've uh, focused on ourselves. We took inventory of the client. We named the problem. What comes next? Then, then it becomes that, uh, that agreement, that relationship that you're going to work together, that uh, they have things that they want from you and that you're going to give them the things that they want. And then, and then it's the real hard work, right? But you have to have that foundation first. And... Uh, Maybe Do you have, have any all tips on, on generating that agreement? Like, is there something you use in order to kind of crystallize that agreement between you and the team or the organization you're working with? The, the, the thing that has worked best for me is one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, as, as I've tried to be efficient and do this with a team and try to rush through it in a, you know, a two or four hour uh, scenario, it, it doesn't work as well as actually just being with the people and, and seeing that kind of build over time. So what's your rule of thumb? Like how much time would you spend on taking inventory, naming the problem and getting to an agreement? That's a great question. I don't have a rule of thumb on that. I don't. I, I, I know that for it to... I know that very early on, we need to have the conversation where I can at least introduce myself and let them know what they can expect from me. If I am a tool, in which, in which problems would you come to use the tool dusted, right? So the, the first thing is, how would they know how to use me? And then it's a matter of just being available and, and having the conversations over time. But Oftentimes it may take weeks or months before you can really build those relationships up and, and have understanding between the both of you. If I was being hired for training, it'd be easier, right? I'm just going to come in and I'm going to, here's the new JavaScript framework and I'll teach it to you and I'll just force the information. But um, these relationships take a little bit longer sometimes. And the, the other aspect of it, which I find sometimes quite puzzling, although very interesting for me as a change agent, is that different people will uh, get warmed up to you at different at a different pace. Like there are people in the team that might be, you know, their personality might be compatible with yours and that's easy to build a rapport with, uh, or they, they are easy to build a rapport with. There might be others who have a totally different personality type and, and maybe you don't even have chemistry and, and it could be a problem, but we should be aware of it early on. Like it's not just the team, right? We're also building relationships individually, which you highlighted when you talked about this one-on-one -on -one conversations. 
Yeah. And, and isn't that the hardest dang thing? If you don't, if it just is not clicking with you and one other person, even if that person is incredibly talented and, and they could be awesome as a, a, a agent of change in their own team, they, they are the person that could have a major impact. If you, if you don't have that connection, it's tough. And sometimes um, you have to let that go. Maybe give it more space to breathe or recognize that, um, you know, you might have to deal with a coalition of the willing and that person just might not be on the plan and you might not be able to fix everything. I, I would say that that should be our initial expectation as well, right? We, we don't know yet what we can't fix, but we know some things we will not be able to fix. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got to spend some time with, um, Woody Zool. Woody Zool is the, uh, mob programmer or, uh, the teaming guy. And he talks about turning up the good. Don't worry about all the problems. Just find the thing that you can do well and make it go better and keep doing that. Keep finding the things that are going well and turning it up. And I would get so frustrated myself when certain teams or individuals weren't, weren't going to help me write that next chapter on how to transform a company, right? You're, you're thinking, man, I'd love to come in here and write a book about how we made these amazing changes, but this one person is just screwing up the whole book. I can't be perfect in here. That's fine. Find the parts that you can and do better there and, and keep growing that. And I have seen this myself where if you get a small coalition working well and you can continue to make things better, sometimes people will see that from close and they will want it and they will start to opt in later. They're just not willing to be the first people to do the work. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful way to, to put it. People can opt in later. Not everybody needs to opt in right away when we want them to. Yeah. But it's Dustin, most efficient, isn't it? <laughs> if like, they just listen to me, right? <laughs> right. Just, just listen to me, you dunderheads. I'm the expert. I've done this before. I can give you the most efficient way. But it doesn't work that way. It, no, it, it never really works doesn't. that way. Not even with us. And if we are honest with ourselves, we have been on the other side of that relationship as well in our past. And and I, I think it's good to to be able to go back and think, okay, so how did I feel when somebody was telling me what to do and what worked, even though I didn't believe them, right? You know, and this is, I, I feel, I agree with you. I feel that this is necessary to talk about because in my background, as you mentioned earlier, I'm a technical guy. I wrote the code. I, I went from sitting in a meeting and listening to people and creating database schemes in my head and figuring out the architecture and the scaling and, you know, trying to figure out, should we rub a little Kubernetes on the problem to make it even better? <laughs> right. So it's like, I'm used to solving the problem. And, and as I would be good at solving the problem myself, and then I was good at my team solving problems. And then I was, as I was able to help the department solve the problems using the technology, that was, that was easy. It was straightforward. But as you focus on that change more, you realize it doesn't work that way. It's not about the answer. It's not about efficiency. Um, it, it's a lot more about effectiveness. And, and for that, you have to learn you have to involve the people. And going back to Jerry Weinberg again, regardless what they tell you, it's always a people problem. Exactly. It doesn't matter what you think. It's always a people problem. Sometimes we are the people who create the problem, but it's always a people problem. Yeah. Dustin, we're getting close to the end, but before we go, uh, where can people find out more about uh, the work that you're doing and also maybe even a conference you're going to and talking more about this topic? Yeah, great. Thank you. So DeltaFreeConsulting.com uh, is my online home, uh, three for the number three. I, I do have a, a few little blog articles out there. I've got some links to videos where I've spoken before. Um, and I do have the other events I've got coming up. 
right now I've got a couple of podcasts on my schedule and I am working with the Agile 23 team. So I'll put that out there too. If people have talks that they would like to have included for the Agile 23 conference in July in Orlando, Florida, US, please uh, go up to the agilealliance.com uh, website and add those in. I'd love to see more great ideas come through. And uh, another place that you can find some of my work is modelingbetterdecisions.com. That's a website that Skylar Watson and I use to start collecting the different models uh, that we have found helpful. And we believe that learning different models and being able to apply them in different situations helps people frame a problem a little bit better and might actually accelerate your ability to solve that problem quickly. Instead of having to try to solve the problem with your gut, can you apply a model to it and maybe find a quicker way to get to a better solution? And at Dustinson, uh, still on Twitter, doing some uh, Mastodon exploration as well there too. But I, I love talking to folks on Twitter. Absolutely. I will put the link on the show, the links, sorry, on the show notes for sure, for people to easily find those websites and uh, to find us. And then why not ask a few follow-up questions, uh, get involved in the conversation. That's, that's what is important for us to grow. So Dustin, thank you very much for being here and for your generosity with your time and your knowledge. Pascal, thank you for taking all of your time to, to keep collecting all these great ideas and, and helping people help people. Hi there, Agile friends. Thank you for sticking around. This year's first global summit dedicated to the product owner role in Scrum will have some amazing keynotes and two tracks filled with firsthand stories and experiences for product owners to learn more about that critical Scrum role. We'll have Roman Pichler, author and product expert, who'll be answering your questions and sharing the most important aspects of the product owner role. We'll also have Colleen Johnson talking about why roadmaps are probably making your life much harder than it needs to be and uh, what to do instead. This talk was quite a success in Agile Online Summit 2022 and Colleen has learned some new tricks, tools, techniques that she will share with us when it comes to roadmaps for the product on a roll. And we will also have Henrik Nibery, author of Scrum and Kanban from the Trenches, as well as one of the creators of the Spotify model. So come in and listen to his stories. And uh, we'll also have, of course, two tracks with uh, many more sessions and even some live sessions. The two tracks will cover practices every product owner should know, uh, where we'll be hosting conversations on topics that product owners need to be familiar with, like product re backlog refinement, planning, and much more. The second track will be on metrics, measuring product and personal success as a product owner. As product owners, it's crucial to have a clear understanding of what are the metrics that drive success for us, and of course, also for the products and businesses that we work with, and we need to continuously measure and optimize those metrics. So in this track, we'll be sharing what's working and what's not in the area of measuring success for product owners. We will also have the opportunity to network with our peers. It's a network event, of course. So get your tickets and join our Slack. Go to uh, bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023. That's all one word, all lowercase. As always, we will have free tickets and VIP tickets, which will give you long-term access to the content of this summit. So check them out at bit.ly forward slash product owner 2023, all lowercase, all one word. I'll see you on the summit floor.